Certain poets live for us just beneath the surface of reality. Their names echo across the decades and the stacking up of centuries, and in our time, we may in fact still honor those names, perhaps have even grown familiar with a sampling of their work, their great themes, their best lines, their anthologized highlights. But it's in moments when the diaphanous membrane of our quiet lives is punctured by a sideways glance of fate that these poets finally speak to us directly. They shrug off the cloak of years and academic notoriety and call to us with the quick of life. And we reach for them in return, knowingly or unwittingly. And if we listen for their voices, we may come to realize that all the while they've been speaking in a language at once familiar to us and foreign. That our mental and spiritual architecture as human beings, in some critical sense, requires the admixture of strangeness, beauty and camaraderie, even kinship they provide, along with the resonant overtones of the many generations of human history which may separate us. Irish visionary poet William Butler Yeats is one such voice for our collective past, and we do well to turn to him again in 2023, precisely 100 years after he became Ireland's first Nobel laureate in literature. For ours is a needy age, an anxious age, as was Yeats's, needful of profound and humane vision, needful for analogies from our civilizational lineage to help ground and anchor us to our mythological moment in time. Needful for the wisdom and honest conveyance of life that only poetic language can truly provide. Welcome to a special edition of the Times Arrow podcast. I'm your host, Alan Guy Wilcox, speaking to you today from the lovely halls of the Jervis Public Library in Rome, New York, a part of the wonderful Mid-York library system. We'll be discussing why the spirited, myth-infused, landscape-saturated, and altogether portentous work of W.B. Yeats might matter more to us in this moment, now that certain technological products have come into prominence such as the rather anodynely named ChatGPT, which seek, apparently, to absolve humankind from the requirements of research, and for that matter, of the inborn responsibility of thinking for ourselves, and most harrowingly, of course, from the tiresome burden of speaking for ourselves. William Butler Yeats was born in June 1865 in Sandy Mount, Dublin, to a pair of rather bohemian parents who were on the fringe of the Protestant ascendancy. In other words, they were part of a belated establishment legacy in Ireland that was very much on the wane during the time of Yeats's boyhood. And while he was born in Dublin, and in many ways considered at home, he'd come to be most closely associated with the landscapes of County Sligo to the west, which he'd immortalize in numerous poems, notably the Lake Isle of Innisfree, Importantly, Yeats would spend a fair portion of his youth with his family in London, away from his beloved home country, and this may have had a galvanizing effect on his poetic character in relation to Ireland. Absence, as we know, has a way of making the heart grow fonder. From the Lake Isle of Innisfree. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. Yeats began his career publishing collections of Irish folktale and myth in the late Victorian period during an era known as the Fen de Siecle. And the end of an era it surely was. Revolutionary Romanticism had changed the face of the world in the preceding hundred years, and it had culminated, along with much major art, poetry, and music, in the rise of nationalism in the 1860s and 70s. Italy, France, Germany, Russia, Ireland, and many other major nations were affected by it. 
Urbanization and industrialization had altered forever the political and social needs of the citizenry in those countries. And advanced mechanization would lead, among many benefits, to enhanced methods of human destruction, which would later be on display in World War I, such as the world had never before experienced. In France, during the fin de siècle, this period coincided with the decadent movement, and in England, with the aesthetic movement. But for Yeats, who was interested himself in locating and rejuvenating an authentic Irish national culture and identity, he looked deep into Ireland's legendary and mythic past for the folklore and heroics that could provide a spirit of Irishness not unlike how William Shakespeare had invented a form of English nationalism with his series of plays from Richard II through Richard III, but especially the run of three plays in the middle known as the Henriad. Henry V became a heroic figure of Englishness for Elizabethans, much like Yeats hoped to resurrect the legendary Cahoolan as the warrior spirit of Irishness at the turn of the century, along with a cast of mythic characters from Ushin and Niav to Maeve and Kathleen Houlihan who would evoke, and Yeats hoped, helped galvanize a spirit of cultural unity in Ireland, which he believed was a necessary precondition for political unity in this colonized land. As his biographer, R. F. Foster, who for many years was Carroll Professor of Irish History at Oxford University, points out, one of Yeats's artistic and poetic preoccupations was how to be authentically Irish while not being a Catholic. This worry of Yeats's goes a long way in helping to elucidate the attractions in a deeper, more mythic Irish past, much of it largely pagan, to be found in the realms of folklore, popular ballads, and creation mythology. As Yeats writes in one of his early plays, for, as we'll see, theater was a crucial component of his cultural vision, Fairies, come take me out of this dull world, for I would ride with you upon the wind run on the top of the disheveled tide and dance upon the mountains like a flame. In part, this attitude and this longing was a reaction to the Victorian rationalism of the day, an over-reliance Yeats felt on a narrow, though admittedly powerful set of precepts centered on the supremacy of human reason. He felt strongly that there were other forms of knowing, ancient, often occult and highly poetic forms of knowledge that should complement the scientific method and ground our technological discoveries in wisdom and good judgment. He mined these deeply in helping to invent modern Irishness, an accomplishment which he can lay claim to in large measure. Came the hour, came the man. Yeats did this in a number of ways not only by beginning his career traveling, listening to, gathering, recording, and publishing Irish folktales, which he did in multiple volumes, and by creating his own enormous body of work, which uses the tableau of Irish mythology as a lens through which to view the times he lived in, both personally and publicly, natively and nationally, a body of work for which, as I mentioned in 1923, he won the Nobel Prize. But his work remarkably extends far beyond his important and permanent verse. In 1904, along with his longtime friend, the aristocrat Lady Augusta Gregory, he founded the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, which serves today, some 120 years after opening its doors, as Ireland's national theatre. Of course, the story doesn't end there. In 1922, a year before winning the world's most exalted literary prize, he was elected as a senator in the Irish Free State and became what we would come to call a smiling public man. It was a complete cosmological, mythological, poetic, and political system, in other words, which Yeats envisioned for Ireland and which he worked tirelessly and successfully to bring into being. He embodied this wish in his own person, and walked the walk, as they say. Yeats had what we might call a holistic view of Irish culture, and in addition to excavating Irish myth, legend, and song in his work, he delved deeply into the occult and esoteric forms of knowledge. 
But with Yeats, as with many enduring writers, the man was greater than the sum of his parts. There is an authoritative lyricism, a declamatory and disarming wisdom, and a rebellious love at work in all Yeats's poems, which beckons us to return to his verse again and again and again. Yeats was closely associated with the Gaelic Revival, also called the Celtic Renaissance or the Irish Literary Revival. As a rather low church Protestant, Yeats sought special ways of knowing and representing the Irish personality, the national soul at a deep and foundational level. For during his life, his country would be compelled to see itself through the looking glass and attempt to recapture a spirit of its most enduring and animated origins. Indeed, he was a student of mysticism not merely Irish, but global, pouring himself into theosophy and the corpus of Jewish mysticism in Kabbalah, ancient Indian wisdom writing and myth in the Upanishads and the Vedas, and even more tendentiously, but ardently, into the fin de siècle forms of occult knowledge such as astrology, tarot, and esoteric groups such as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Looking backwards, much of this might seem pretty dicey as grounds for a political culture, but it is indicative of a searching and experimental temperament which would pay off dividends in his poetic work. Listen to an early metaphysical love lyric, The Song of the Wandering Angus, from his 1899 collection, The Wind Among the Reeds, for a sample of Yeats's authentic and rather magic language. The Song of the Wandering Angus. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled the hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Compare this earthen and homespun language, this authentic poetry, with the thin gruel of many of today's methods of communication, from the emoji and the gif, from the text message and the email having supplanted the telegram, the penny postcard and the letter, to the arrival of a new and I believe genuine menace, a wolf in sheep's clothing if I may be so bold, ChatGPT. Heavily mediated, pasteurized and harvested vis-a-vis -a, -vis a rank of amalgamation of sources which, in my view, violates the intellectual property rights of real and dedicated readers, thinkers, and writers, ChatGPT provides its users with glib, transactional language, which is not many steps removed from Orwellian newspeak, if you were to ask me. Newspeak, of course, being a fictive language central to the action of Orwell's novel 1984 which is designed to limit a full range of human expression by stripping out the individuated, highly inflected, and idiosyncratic colors from our language and replacing them with pablum, prefabricated language, conventional wisdom, and of course, cliché. Compare this with another of Yeats' early songs, The Song of the Happy Shepherd, from his 1889 collection, Crossways. This poem, which has the late Victorian spirit of scientific rationalism heavy on the mind, seems to forecast the assault on ancient wisdom and literary language with a new form of vacuous materialism, the my way or the highway approach to scientific discourse that in fact supplants the role of religion in our lives rather than attempting to augment it or evolve past it as if 
that were possible. The song of the happy shepherd. The woods of Arcadi are dead, and over is their antique joy. Of old the world on dreaming fed, gray truth is now her painted toy. Yet still she turns her restless head, but oh, sick children of the world, of all the many changing things in dreary dancing past us world, to the cracked tune that Kronos sings, words alone are certain good. Where are now the warring kings, word be mockers? By the rude, where are now the warring kings? An idle word is now their glory, by the stammering schoolboy said, reading some entangled story. The kings of the old time are dead. The wandering earth herself may be only a sudden flaming word, in clanging space a moment heard, troubling the endless reverie. Then no wise worship dusty deeds, nor seek, for this is also sooth, to hunger fiercely after truth, lest all thy toiling only breeds new dreams, new dreams. There is no truth saving in thine own heart. Seek then no learning from the starry men who follow with the optic glass the whirling ways of stars that pass. Seek then, for this is also sooth, no word of theirs. The cold star bane has cloven and rent their hearts in twain, and dead is all their human truth. Go gather by the humming sea some twisted echo harboring shell, and to its lips thy story tell, and they thy comforters will be, rewarding in melodious guile thy fretful words a little while, till day shall singing fade in ruth, and die a pearly brotherhood. For words alone are certain good. Sing then, for this is also sooth. I must be gone. There is a grave where daffodil and lily wave, and I would please the hapless fawn buried under the sleepy ground with mirthful songs before the dawn. His shouting days with mirth were crowned, and still I dream he treads the lawn, walking ghostly in the dew, pierced by my glad singing through my songs of old earth's dreamy youth. But ah, she dreams not now, Dream thou, for fair are poppies on the brow. Dream, dream, for this is also sooth. Crossways appeared at the end of a decade which saw the death of Charles Parnell, along with the dream for many of home rule. It also saw the rise of the decadent movement and the aesthetic movement, important precursors to the official advent of modernism. The epigraph to Crossways comes from William Blake. Blake's name alone should set off a constellation of ideas about Yeats's poetic project, his interests, his aesthetic, his relationship with language and spirituality. Blake was a mystic, a visionary English poet and illustrator who is considered not only one of the most cogent and penetrating of English poets, but who is one of the key progenitors of English Romanticism the decisive precursor to Coleridge and Wordsworth, to Keats, Shelley, Byron, Clare, and many other poets whose words would forever change the literary temperament of the 19th century. It's a legacy so vast in our own day that it's often impossible to see. Here's the rather impacted epigraph to Yeats's collection, Crossways, taken from William Blake's poem, Revival of the Eternal Man. The stars are threshed and the souls are threshed from their husks. Eternity, soul, stars. This is language used in this environment of words that has fallen from us in our belated world. We live in an era which contends on an almost daily basis with mass shootings domestically and despotic militarism abroad. We've become increasingly siloed in our friend groups and our political associations. A failure to match and master these clear and present crises is, I think, directly related to our atrophied public square. We've fallen out of practice speaking to and with one another, and instead gloatingly speak over and past one another. Heretofore, the words themselves which we generate and express in our hearts and the timing and humanity with which we express them are steeped in a tradition of human wisdom and folly. And our capability to chart that tradition 
and map it over our own moments and movements to determine with a spirit of self-respect and self-determination how we'd like to participate in that tradition, that's a faculty which must be cultivated. That cultivation should begin when we are children and carry with us throughout our youth and adult lives, always growing, deepening, expanding, strengthening, and transmitting what's best while laying aside what is unfruitful, deleterious, or wrong-headed. In order to engage in this great human endeavor, we must welcome in the great harvest of words and wisdom and marry these words with a vision for the world that is humane and based in virtue and values. There are gray areas here, points of ambiguity, nuanced viewpoints which require reconciliation. The absolute last thing we should want for ourselves and for the lives of those who will come after us is to abdicate our very human and very moral responsibility to carry our own burdens, especially those which involve language, morality, beauty, truth, and wisdom. We look to Yeats in anxiety-saturated periods when it seems certain that things will fall apart. When we arrive at our own fantasy ecla, at the end of a cycle or era that finds us with a lack of confidence in ourselves and a clamoring to return either to our ancient roots on the one hand or to wipe the slate clean completely on the other, as the braided effects of World War I, the Russian Revolution, and the Anglo-Irish conflict had done in Yeats's time when he wrote his most famous poem, The Second Coming. In that poem, as in his other great works, Yeats names and nourishes our spiritual condition. While the great project in his lifetime was rejuvenating a spirit of Irish cultural identity and political viability, his greatest poems beckon out into the realm of enduring human universals, and the language he does this with is unique and hard won. Amassed through a lifetime of dedication and, we might say, a special genius that Yeats was touched with, which is not uncommon among the great balladeers, poets, and singers of the Emerald Isle. At this important inflection point in human history, where we're being given the option to seed perhaps the single greatest gift that makes us human, our ability to dream, think, and communicate, not just in prose, but in poetry to one another in the present moment, but also into the future, I humbly ask that you do not cede control of your language to the techno-utopianists, however well-meaning they may be, to generative AI, to politicians, to anyone in fact. Keep the biodiversity of your own unique language alive by engulfing the nutrient-rich linguistic tableau of our greatest writers and most sagacious thinkers. As Shakespeare's Falstaff would teach his sons to forswear thin potations, I would kindly advise that we wean ourselves as swiftly as possible from the lotus-like entrancement of generative AI. And I've been enticed to this too, in full disclosure. Instead, let's favor an unmediated and powerfully direct, enduringly romantic experience of life in the world. It's nothing less than the defense of poetry itself and one of its greatest practitioners and champions, the Irish poet and senator, William Butler Yeats. The Second Coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Thank you for watching. 
find your own words and your own poetic forebears and bring their work into your own breath and body and spirit. Do not cede your birthright, your language, to others. Take the infinitely more desirable path and make literature a way of life, not just for the richness, beauty, and wisdom it will bring into your own world, but for the continuity and humanity of those who will come after us. Thank you, and happy reading. Special thanks to the wonderful folks at the Jervis Public Library. Make sure to go visit and give a lot of love to your local library, no matter where you are. For more in-depth literary content like this, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And to enact your own literary adventures, make sure to visit us at timesarrow.org.